On April 19, 1997, 16-year-old Eva Blanca went to a disco with her friends. At 23.45, the girl said goodbye to her friend not far from her house, and from that moment she was never heard from again. Eva's relatives asked the police to solve the case as soon as possible, but years passed and no results appeared. Eva Blanca was born on February 17, 1981, in Madrid, Spain. She was the eldest of three sisters and lived in Algeta, a municipality of Madrid, with her parents Olga and Manola and sisters Maria and Rebecca. On April 19, 1997, 16-year-old Eva went for a walk with her usual group of friends. In the afternoon they played tennis and in the evening they went to a disco. Eva had to be home by midnight. Normally her curfew was 11 p.m., but that day she was released an hour later. To clarify, according to her parents, Eva was very responsible about her time home. Usually she was never late, and if she was late, it was only for five minutes at the most. But that night Eva did not come at the appointed time. After midnight on April 20th, Eva's mother became very nervous that her daughter was not home, not knowing what to do. She called acquaintances to see if they knew where Eva was or if she was at their house. Maybe the girl just forgot to call home. One of Eva's friends told her mother that she had walked her to a residential neighborhood where there was an open field nearby, and that the two girls parted ways at about 11.45 p.m. It was a short and unusual route for a girl, but that day Eva decided to walk home a little faster because she wanted to arrive at the appointed time. That was the last time she would be seen. Given the distance between the open field and Eva's house, by the time her mother made that call, the girl should have already shown up. So Eva's father, Manola, took the car and started driving around the village, taking Eva's photograph with him, and began asking people he met who were walking or returning home if they had seen her. He looked for her in open fields, peering into ditches, thinking maybe she had been hit by a car and somewhere in these parts she needed help. Neighbors and friends also joined the search, but no one seemed to have seen Eva at this time. The family then went to the civil guard station in the morning to file a missing persons report. Because Eva was a minor, authorities quickly began searching for her. They spent all morning trying to find any clues, evidence, or witnesses who saw the girl after her friend walked her out. But no one seemed to have seen anything. Officers then sent Eva's photo to all media outlets, but that didn't help much either. A little later in the morning after Eva's photo appeared on the news in a massive search in the village, the elderly people found the body in a ditch that was on the Cabins Road, about six kilometers from Algi. They called the civil guard and when they arrived on the scene, they recognized the girl who was there as Eva Blanca. The body was taken for examination and apparently the whole scene was also to be analyzed to find out if the girl had been killed at that spot, if the body had been left there after she had been killed and what had really happened that early morning. However, it was not possible to collect much evidence at the site because it was raining heavily and many items were probably washed away. Only a few footprints were found. Some of them belonged to Eva and others to an unknown person who was believed to be her killer. They were a pair of size 42 shoe prints. According to the forensic examination, it was determined that Eva had received 19 stab wounds to her back, neck, and head. It was one stab wound that was found to be fatal. It was revealed that Eva was sitting when she received this stab wound. The wound was very deep and was in the side of her body. The rest of the wounds were somewhat superficial, and from the description of the person who made this conclusion, could correspond to injuries sustained as a result of an outburst of anger. In addition to the stab wounds, Eva's hymen was torn 3 centimeters and DNA was taken from her body. Seminal fluid was found on her genitals and in her mouth. In addition, a red fiber was found, presumably from car upholstery. When found, she was fully clothed except that one sleeve of her jacket had been torn off. The crime weapon was believed to be an 8 to 10 centimeter knife. Experts also determined that the death occurred at approximately 4 a.m. on April 20th. This means that several hours elapsed between the time Eva was last seen and the time of her death, suggesting that she spent some time in the ditch in agony and that death was not instantaneous. Police have therefore launched a search for a potential perpetrator. Given that some of the wounds were mistaken for those resulting from an outburst of anger, they began to study Eva's immediate surroundings. The fact that the girl was fully clothed also provoked much discussion. At one point, the police speculated that Eva may have had consensual sexual intercourse and that the death occurred afterward as a result of an argument. They also believed that the girl had not intended to get into a stranger's car and that it must have been someone she knew. It was believed that she was in the car because, as I said, she received her first stab wound sitting down and also because of the fiber that was on her body, fiber from the upholstery. At the time, Eva had an ex-boyfriend named Miguel. 
When Miguel was questioned, he had a cut, but he knew nothing about what had happened and could not be connected to anything that was going on. In addition, Eva had a very close friend at this time. Some sources mention this young man as her boyfriend and others only as a friend. However, he and Eva were very close, and he was the one who usually walked her home when they went out. This guy named Sebas was also under investigation, but he was quickly dismissed from the investigation because that night he didn't go to the Algeti party with his friends as he always did. He had gone to Madrid with other comrades to spend the night and have fun there and then return back to the village. Therefore, he could not be connected with everything that happened at that time. The Guardia Civil thought they could solve the case very quickly, but since these two guys had been ruled out, they had no suspects left, and they began an investigation that would last many, many years. Having ruled out these two guys, the police focused on the next of kin. At the time, despite the existence of DNA evidence, even the family members themselves were unaware of their existence. Civil Guard officers took a DNA sample from Eva's father. They took it from a cigarette but he had left at the bar after talking to the Civil Guard officers. That test came back completely negative. Similarly, samples were taken from Eva's other relatives, and all of these tests came back negative. Having already ruled out the girl's immediate family, the Civil Guard reported that there was a sample of seminal fluid from which DNA testing could obviously be done. Eva's father suggested that all the men in the village submit DNA samples, which would eliminate suspects and speed up the investigation a bit. Even the mayor of Algid came to support the Blanca family with this initiative. However, it was the judges who said it would not be done because for them it would violate the rights of the men of the village, which is unthinkable, and also because for them it would not help the investigation. Amazingly, despite the refusal, Eva's father received 2,000 DNA samples. Virtually every villager brought a sample on a voluntary basis. But since they could not be used, these samples were kept until it was known whether they could be used or not. While all this was going on, the investigation continued and some of her diaries were found in Eva's room. In the last diary, dated 96 and 97, you could see what the last days of Eva's life were like. She wrote about her friends, about her exams at school, and looked like a perfectly normal teenager, a girl who goes out with her friends, goes to school, is with her family, who has her own problems, her girlfriends, her boys, and, as I said, a typical average teenager of the time. What caught my attention was the last pages of one of the diaries. There Eva wrote many, many times Eva in 343110. This number has caused a lot of controversy. Consequently, many people who were not officially involved in the investigation and who had not been approached by anyone began to try to find out the meaning of these numbers. Many began to talk about satanic cults, that Eva belonged to some kind of sect, and even said that she was a member of neo-Nazi or extreme right-wing groups. At one point the police even investigated, but it was completely dropped because there was nothing real about it. It was just people who wanted to get some publicity because the investigation was in full swing and it was all over the news in Spain. Maybe these numbers were some kind of game among teenagers. Maybe it's some hidden word or name, but it wouldn't have much to do with the investigation. Years passed, and in 2000 a judge finally agreed to DNA testing, but not in the way the family had proposed. It was said that DNA tests should only be conducted on Eva's close relatives and possible perpetrators who were living in Algeta at the time of the events. As a result, 45 DNA tests were conducted, 12 on Eva's paternal relatives, 6 on her maternal relatives, and on other men who had criminal records and were living in Algeta at the time of the crime. All of these tests came back negative and yielded no results. As the years passed, there was great fear that Eva's case would fall under the statute of limitations in Spain, where the statute of limitations for murder cases is 20 years. The more time passed, the closer the date got, and it was very hard for the family to think that Eva's killer might never be caught. Obviously, it was also very difficult for the civil guard and the people in charge of the investigation to realize that time was passing and there was no consistent evidence of who might have been Eva's killer. It was in 2007 that one of the leaders of the investigation had an idea. He heard about the advances in DNA analysis at the time and decided to ask the University of Santiago de Compostinal to do a very specific analysis of the DNA sample found on Eve's body to determine some characteristics of the man who left her. They wanted to know where he came from, the color of his eyes, the color of his hair, and similar things that could already be known through DNA at that time. This analysis showed that the person who left the DNA sample was from North Africa. This further narrowed the suspect pool, as there were about 300 men of North African descent living in Algeta at the time of the incident. Officers therefore began asking them to provide DNA samples, not only of themselves but also of their immediate family members. 
However, it was very difficult to obtain all the DNA samples. Because of all the eligible residents of Algeet at the time, only about 20 were left in the village, and it was from them that DNA was collected in the first place. Many others lived in other parts of Spain, some had returned to their native places, and the rest lived in different parts of Europe. So there was a lot of work by the Guardia Civil behind all of this, searching, volunteering people, taking samples, organizing a meeting place that suited both the Guardia Civil and the people in general. It was a very thorough job until they found evidence that gave them a clue. Although the analysis of this person was not 100% conclusive and only gave a 97% match, it meant that the person who killed Eva Blanco was related to the person from whom the sample was taken, presumably a brother. The man was tested and it was found that he came from a family of six siblings. The police tracked down a second brother who still lived in Spain, took a sample from him, and the result was the same, a 97% match. Thus, the police learned that the person they were looking for was a third brother named Ahmet Selch George. By that time, Ahmet was no longer living in Spain but in France. He had lived in Algeta when he was 32 years old and was married to a local woman at the time of the crime. He already had several children. It became known that Ahmed left Algeta two years after Eva's murder when the police started talking about DNA testing and neighbors started voluntarily submitting samples. Ahmed made a living in the village delivering flowers. Eva's family was not very close to this man, they socialized more with his brother, who was more outgoing. However, they did not have a special relationship with him either, he was just another neighbor. Some of Ahmed's companions said that during his lifetime he was a very violent person, especially when he drank, and he lost his temper on more than one occasion. After this information was confirmed thanks to Interpol, an international arrest warrant was issued and Ahmed was captured in France, where he was already living with another wife. The arrest took place in 2015. The man was taken to Spain to begin the trial and a DNA sample was taken from him, which when compared to the sample from the crime scene was found to be 100% compatible. Thus, it was already known that the DNA belonged to him. After the DNA test came back positive, Ahmet began to recount what he said happened on the night of April 19, 1997. The man said he was calmly walking down the street when he saw the body of Eva Blanco. He then allegedly walked over to look, at which point two men told him that he should ejaculate on Eva and that if he did not, they would take his life. Ahmet said he agreed because he feared for his life, did as he was ordered and went home. He said that he had nothing to do with the crime or what happened to Eva, and that he was simply used by the two anonymous men to frame him for the murder. Ahmed's defense, for its part, did not focus so much on his words, but began to put forward old hypotheses that the civil guard had put forward about the crime. Recall that on the first day of the investigation, authorities initially believed that the wounds were inflicted in a state of intense anger, and that it was a person from Eva's inner circle. Ahmed's defense stated that it could not have been him, as he had no relationship with Eva's family. In addition, the man's lawyer put forward such hypotheses that began to develop around the case from the very beginning, such as the version that Eva was a member of an extreme right-wing group and that she should not have gotten into the car with the man from North Africa because she probably would not have felt good with this man and that she probably hated him, instead of getting into the car, would have done the opposite. Recall that all of these hypotheses were ruled out by the Guardia Civil, so they really didn't have much basis in fact. In 2015, Ahmet was arrested in France and transferred to Spain before extradition. In Spain, he had a suicide attempt and was therefore placed under surveillance by several prison staff. However, in early 2016, the court revoked this measure and Ahmet was found dead in his cell on January 29, 2016. This is why he was never brought to trial, convicted or sentenced. Despite the results of the DNA test that clearly indicated his guilt, to this day some argue that he was not guilty, but merely used as a scapegoat. Friends, what do you think of this story? Death by suicide is already a punishment for him or he should have been in prison all his life. Write your opinion in the comments, as well as subscribe to the channel and put likes.